right, so in today's video, I'm going to be showing you how I created this modernized version of David. So I basically took Michelangelo's iconic sculpture and I decided to breathe some life into it by creating a human version. So this is not going to be a step-by-step -step tutorial where we create the image from start to finish. Instead, this is going to be a breakdown video that's full of tips and tricks and is mainly focused on workflow. So I'm going to be using an array of 3D programs. I'm going to be using ZBrush. Dares, Marvelous Designer, Cinema 4D and Octane Render as well as Photoshop and I'll be showing you how I uh, utilized artificial intelligence to generate David's face which I personally think is probably the most exciting part of this entire workflow. So if you're interested to see how images like this are created then without further ado let's get started. Okay, so let's talk about the statue of David. Now, how did I actually get my hands onto this magnificent and iconic statue? All right, so it was actually really simple. I'm using a website called mymanufactory.com and these people have a huge library of scanned models, whether it's statues or toys, you'll find so many different objects on this website and the best part is a lot of these models are actually free uh, which blew my mind the first time I discovered this website uh, but obviously a lot of them have some licensing that you need to respect but the fact is I went to mymanufacturer.com I literally went into the search bar and I typed in David statue and immediately my first search result was the statue of David that was created by scan the world so the awesome thing about this scan statue is that this statue is from one of the museums in Florida Italy. Now I don't know how to say this correctly but it's the Accademia di Belle Arti in Florence, Italy. They've gone ahead and they've actually scanned the statue of David. So this means I'm getting an accurate representation of what David looks like. You know I'm getting all of this accurate anatomy, his facial, uh, facial features and instead of me just using a generic Daz character and putting it into this pose, I feel like an actual scan is going to give me the most accurate result because again I'm trying to create a modernized and human version of David. So it only makes sense to have an actual, you know, realistic and accurate result of the David statue. So this was the best option for me and it's completely for free. So I just click on download and I gain access to the STL that I can import into ZBrush. So the cleanup process for the David statue was actually not too difficult. Now that I had access to this STL file, I could import that into ZBrush and I was good to go. But I was also going to use another weapon within my design arsenal called Dare Studio. And this allows you to create these 3D humans that you can actually pose and then you can export them out as OBJs and you can bring that back into ZBrush. So essentially in Daz 3D I created a Genesis 3 male and I started posing this character and I tried to match the pose as close as possible to David's pose. One of the most important areas to take notice of during the posing process is the hand on the Daz character. I wanted to pose those fingers and try and match it as close as possible because this Daz character's hand is be is, is essentially going to become the new hand on our David statue because I'm going to be cutting it off and merging it back onto the 3D scanned statue version. So once I'm happy with my pose, I go ahead and I export this out as an OBJ. I can now import that Daz character into ZBrush and if I turn on the polygroups I can see that the Daz character already has a lot of polygroups for the hand. So if I hold on Control Shift and I left click I can isolate certain parts of the character and then I can essentially just split this off. So if I go to my sub tools and I go to split hidden. Uh, so whatever is hidden it will basically remove it. So I could isolate the hand on its own and that would be a separate piece of, a, of geometry. So now I've, I've essentially chopped off the hand from this Daz character and I'm going to be merging that back onto the David statue. So on the David statue the first thing I needed to do was I needed to use the masking brush to mask the area on David's hand that I wanted to remove. So I would use the lasso tool and just mask on the hand and then I would go to my poly groups and I would basically group masked. So that creates a poly group for the hand region that's been masked. Then I can press Control shift and left click to isolate and I can hide this hand. So once the, the hand has actually been hidden, if I go to geometry and I go to modify topology, I can go to uh, delete hidden. So that deletes uh, that hand of the David character. So now what it, essentially I have is I've got a hand from my Daz character and on the David statue I no longer have a hand. So I'll be able to take that Daz character's hand and merge it onto the David statue. 
I will now go through the process of using Dynamesh to merge this hand seamlessly onto the original statue. So let me show you how that's done. Alright, so it's time to Dynamesh. So in order for me to join this hand onto the statue, I need to make sure that my statue over here, if I click on this arrow, this is going to move this down in my layer stack. I'm going to make sure this is above the hand. And then I'm basically going to be merging the statue onto the hand. So I'll go to Merge and then Merge Down. Right, you get this warning message that it's an undoable operation. So make sure that before you merge that you're 100% 100 ready with this process. Now I'll click on OK. So now this hand is a part of the statue. Uh, but obviously right now this still looks odd, right? Because this hand has this massive hole in it. And this doesn't look like one piece. And this is where Dynamesh comes in handy. And just make sure if your character does have a mask on it right now, just hold on Control and click and drag over here to remove any masks that might be on there. So now if I go to Geometry and Dynamesh, right, so this character's resolution is currently on 582,000. So I want to make sure this resolution is quite high before I Dynamesh so that I still keep some of these details because if it's too low, I'm going to be losing a lot of the information that's on the scanned statue. So 1264 is perfect. And now when I click on Dynamesh, just pay attention to what happens in this region. There we go. So now this hand has been magically sewed onto the statue. So if I just select maybe the clay buildup, and if I hold down shift and access the smooth brush, I can now smooth this region. But look at that. This has been joined together and we've taken a different limb from another character, from that Daz character, and joined it on to David. So now this is where your knowledge about anatomy uh, is going to have to come in, in handy. If you understand you know, the anatomy of the forearm, you'll be able to re-sculpt uh, some of that anatomy back in place so that this looks uh, natural. Okay, and there we go. So that's the exact same process that I used for cleaning this up. If the fingers have joined like this, that means that the gap between the fingers you need to widen that gap just a little bit so that doesn't happen. Uh, but anyway, if I cover the entire cleanup process, this, this video would be way too long. But I wanted to show you the technique for doing this. And that's exactly how I cleaned up these hands over here. And yeah, so this is the process for cleaning up the statue by combining other limbs. I consider it to be a pretty smart way uh, to add additional anatomy onto a character instead of having to sculpt it completely from scratch. So by utilizing these techniques, I would be able to clean this model up and then I'll have a high-res version that I can export out as an OBJ. But since I'm going to be creating the garment next, I would also want an optimized version. So I would want to duplicate the body of David and then go to my Z plugin and use the decimation master. So I would pre-process current, put my decimation amount on about 10%, decimate that, it will drastically reduce the polygon count. And then I can export that out as a version of David that would be considered optimized or low poly that would work perfectly within Marvelous Designer. So the method I used for creating David's clothing was to use a program called Marvelous Designer. Now this is a fantastic solution for doing fabric simulation and it's my go-to program for creating garments. So one of the biggest hurdles that I needed to overcome was the fact that I needed to create a garment and then simulate it on a pose character. Now this can be very tricky to do especially if you're new to the program and you don't know how to position clothing, this is going to be a nightmare of a process. So how did I simplify this? And I want to show you just how simple it is. So I used Daz 3D to create a Genesis 3 male. And then essentially, I just created a pose that goes from the A pose to a posed state. So that posed state is going to match as close as possible to David's pose. So once I was happy with that, I actually exported this out, I exported it out of the program as a Collada file with the animations, the animations intact. And then I'm going to be using this Collada file in Marvelous Designer to simulate the garment from the A pose to the pose state. So now that I know that I had a character with the starting pose and the A pose, this is perfect for drafting a pattern. So you can go ahead and create your garment. This was a template garment that I used. It also happened to be in the A pose, but I did tweak it a little bit further just to fit the proportions of this character a little bit better. But it's way easier to create and draft garments on a A pose or T pose character. 
And then once I was done with the garment, I would simply just go to animation. And since this is a collider file, it contains all of that animation data. Now, if I scrub forward, you can see a pose to pose state. So to get the garment to follow the character into the pose state, you just click on the record button and you'll see that the garment starts to move with the character's movement as well. And the garment itself is now going from that A pose to the posed state. So now if I go back to simulation and I hide my character, I now have a garment that's in a pose state as well that should match David's pose. So now what I can essentially do is, since I have this Daz character as an avatar, I can delete this avatar and I can import an OBJ. So this OBJ would be a decimated version of the Daz statue from ZBrush. So something with a reduced polygon count, because if the polygon count is too high, it's going to make the program chug. So I did create a low res version. And in earlier versions of MD, I know you can add an OBJ, but I'm using Marvelous Designer 10 and over here by load type, they have this add option. And I'll just use auto scale avatar and I'll click on okay. So now it's going to import a lower res version of David, right? I know this one still has the plinth, uh, which is visible over here. I did create a version that's obviously cleaned up, but I'm just showing you the overall workflow and a methodology that I used. So now since I have a garment that's already posed similar to David, it will be a lot easier to simulate this garment on this character. In this case, since there's two pieces of this garment, I'm actually going to freeze and hide the top garment over here. And I can maybe just start with the pants. So now you can see I can position these pants closer to David's pose. And it just means that it will be a lot easier to simulate on a posed character. I can also help this by bringing some of these pieces forward. I can do the same over here. And then when I simulate this, it just means that I won't have that much of a headache when it comes to fitting these uh, garment and pattern pieces onto our David statue because remember the garment is in that pose state as well. So maybe if I press simulate, it would just be a little bit easier to fit on there. Now obviously, the results look a little bit crazy right now and that's because this isn't the final cleaned up David version but the most important thing about this is the workflow and that's how I actually went ahead and you know fit uh, managed to fit these pattern pieces onto a posed character. So once I'm happy with all of the drafting and uh, fabric simulation on the David statue I can go ahead and actually lower the particle distance so by lowering this number I'm basically making the object a lot more dense which means that it's going to show a lot more detail I'll be able to see more folds and more micro detail on the garment as well then I'll bring it all the way down to five click on simulate and then I'm good to go now for the purpose of this garment you know I wasn't going to do anything crazy with it I'm not going to be modifying it that much in ZBrush so I would manually select certain pieces and add my own thickness onto the garment directly in ZBrush so you can see if I select thick textured surface I can see which areas have some thickness applied to it. All right, so I was simplifying the whole process. I wasn't going to be modifying this like crazy in ZBrush. So I did the thickness directly in ZBrush, uh, directly within Marvelous Designer. And then from here, it's on five and I can export the OBJ selected. But before I do that, I also go to my UV editor and I just make sure that I go to reset UV to 2D arrangement and then I go to fit all UV to zero one. So this is an option inv available in Marvelous Designer 10. It fits all of those pattern pieces into one UV tile and that just makes sure everything is nice and organized. And then I can select this entire garment and I can file export OBJ selected. And when I'm saving this out with the garment, for this purpose, I decided to save it out as thick with unified UVs all graphics and trims it's going to save out any you know if you put any colors or graphics on the on the actual pattern it saves it out as well and then I just click on OK and my garment is good to go I can actually bring that uh, bring this garment directly into ZBrush all right so let's talk about finalizing this character so now that I have my cleaned up statue in ZBrush and I created a garment within Marvelous Designer it's now time to start appending that onto this character you'll also notice there's some shoes on our character over here and if you're wondering where that's from that's from Daz 3D so in Daz 3D on this post character I'll basically append some shoes 
export out this character as an OBJ, bring this OBJ into ZBrush, right? Bring him into ZBrush and then split off those shoes and just append it onto my statue. So with the Garmin from Marvelous Designer, by the way, if you're appending any accessories, it's always a good idea to click on the star icon, go to import, and in this case, uh, let's see, I'm gonna just import the suit I made in Marvelous Designer. If I see this message, I'll just click on no. So here's the suit that was made in Marvelous Designer. So now I can go back to my statue over here, then I can go to append and go and find my suit. And now it's appended my Marvelous Designer suit onto David. Now you can see there's some areas over here that I might still need to fix and that's where ZBrush comes in handy because now I can fix these certain areas. So I can hold on Alt, left click to select the suit, you know like bring out certain regions like that and maybe fix certain shapes of our garment just using the regular move brush. So I'm, I'm not doing anything crazy uh, on the statue or on this final uh, garment. I'm just repositioning or, you know, just using the move brush to adjust maybe the silhouette of the garment. Nothing crazy. I kept everything very simple. I usually go very in-depth with garments, but I just wanted to keep the process of this really, really basic. So now I'm finalizing the garment. The shoes are from Daz. And another really important aspect of this character is the hair. And if you're wondering how I made the hair, I actually did not make the hair. The hair is a bunch of hair cards. But the hair itself is a Daz asset and the hair is called Jonas hair for Genesis 3 males. So then I would go back to Daz and append the hair onto a Genesis 3 character and export that out. So at this point I would be considered finished with you know placing accessories. You'll notice some other stuff on our David character over here like these rings. And that's just basically I appended a ring 3D and moved it into position. There's also some jewelry over here. This is a jewelry IMM brush, a tileable brush that I created. And I just wanted to give him uh, some chains because I thought it looked pretty, pretty cool. And you can see I was also playing around some of the colors of the garment just to get a general idea of what he would look like with a white suit. I also quickly created a tie in Marvelous Designer and just imported that into ZBrush and appended it. Now one thing I want to uh, just mention because at this point I'm done I'll be exporting this out as OBJs and taking it over to Cinema 40 and Octane Render to set up the lighting and shaders for our character but the hair on this character so this is an asset but if I go to the hair right now and I hide this <laughs> you can see David's scalp or this part of David's hair looks really messed up so I, I basically took the clay build up and I started like pushing this down because I didn't want this part of the sculpture's hair to be poking through the original hair. You can still see it a little bit underneath over there, but I wanted to hide it as much as possible. So I'm using the clay build up holding Alt to invert my brush, which, which basically means that it's pushing this part of the sculpture down and hiding it underneath the hair. So that when I render this, I'm gonna see more of this hair visible and the hair texture visible instead of the original, you know, uh, the original statue's hair poking through. So that was another workflow tip that I really uh, wanted to mention because it was actually very important to create this convincing, uh, realistic looking hair. Okay, and, and then at this point I'm done and I can export out every single subtool here. You can see I created subtools for the hair, the jewelry. It's all separated just for organization purposes. And I can go ahead and export these out as OBJs and then assemble the entire scene in Cinema 4D and Octane Render. All right, so in Cinema 4D, it's just as simple as going to File, Merge, and merging all of those OBJ files into Cinema 4D. So I created a folder for David over here. You can see I imported the hair, the ties, all of the jewelry, the shoes, and then of course the David statue as well. So once that's all organized and placed into a group, I'm now good to go. I can focus on other aspects as well, uh, like maybe putting some additional geometry in the scene for the backdrop, but you'll see just how simple the scene is. So I am using Octane Render for my rendering and for my, for my materials. Now you can see I have a lot of different cameras over here, but if I just snap out of this camera, this scene is super basic, right? We've just got a flow in our scene, which is just a basic cube. And that material is just a glossy material with some roughness applied onto it. 
we've got a backdrop which shares the exact same material and then we have this piece of geometry over here which is a, a mo fractal cube and this is from the French monkey uh, he sells like a pack of these really interesting looking pieces of geometry so I thought that looked really cool as a backdrop so I'm keeping the scene simple because I don't want anything else to detract from our main subject which is obviously the modernized version of David and then in our scene I'm lighting this entire scene with one area light just a single octane light which is this overhead light which I, I feel like uh, basically creates these really interesting shadows uh, on David that you see in the final image. So I also want to mention the overall texturing of the suit and I did this directly within Cinema 4D and Octane Render. I didn't, want, I didn't want to leave the program and go to Substance Painter. I wanted to use my own tileable displacement patterns and that's exactly what you're seeing over here. So I created just a regular Octane material that's uh, basically a glossy material for all of these fabric pieces but I'm detailing this using these tileable patterns so you can see for this map over here this is a displacement map and that's what's creating this really awesome diamond studded uh, pattern for the sleeves and since this garment has UVs from Marvelous Designer so whenever you create a garment in Marvelous Designer it's automatically creating the UVs I got this really awesome uh, UV layout for this part of the sleeve so I thought this creates a really nice a visual interest and breakup for this part of the garment and then if I zoom in here on the garment as well you'll see that there's some additional texture on the inside of the suit over here and that's the reaction diffusion pattern I used and then breaking up the surface of the garment over here using some of my fabric and knit and it's completely tileable so it looks really nice once you decrease the size of these tileable materials as well so this product has helped me and a lot of other people a countless a number of times it's my go-to especially whenever I want to use patterns on clothing or with geometry or anything in general this really comes in handy so it's as simple as that and then the gold pieces on the character as well is just a you know over here you'll see it's called trim it's just a regular metallic uh, material type with some roughness applied onto it and that gives me that final aesthetic so at this point I've gone ahead, I've created a scene, I've imported all of those OBJs, I've assembled a basic backdrop, I'm using a single area light and I've created some materials for our David character as well. And for the hair, uh, since this was a purchase DAS asset, it actually includes its own opacity map as well and it includes a diffuse map. So you just create a material like that and apply it onto the hair from Daz and you'll get some really nice looking hair and you can control the amount of thickness of the hair by adjusting this gamma value so that's just another quick tip uh, regarding the materials but anyway once I've created all of these materials then I create a camera and I'll lock this in place and I would right click and just create a protection tag so that I can't move this camera around it's basically that icon and then in the camera settings I'm also using the camera imager and my response is on linear. I play around a little bit with the exposure and the gamma just to get you know uh, an aesthetic that I'm happy with and I'll also apply a little bit of bloom on there just to get some of those uh, highlights to glow and shine a little bit. So this was the final rendered image from Cinema 4D. So we did discuss the materials like for the clothing and all of that very briefly but what about the skin? How was the skin created? And this skin material, if you go to Octane Render and you go to the Live DB, so you live view and you go to Open Live DB, and you just simply type in skin, you'll just search the online library for a skin material. So I think, yeah, over here I just downloaded this Dare skin material. And when you double click on that, it adds it over here. And it's basically this mix shader. And I just dragged and dropped that onto my character to create this Dare skin. Okay, so at this point I have my final rendered image with all of these materials on the garment. You can see I've even got a skin texture for the statue. But one of the most important aspects of this image is the face. How on earth did I generate this face for David? And this is where artificial intelligence is going to come in handy. And I want to show you the process that I used for generating this human version of our David statue. Okay, so first things first, I want to create an image and use that image as an input source on this artificial intelligence website. So the two websites is Portrait AI, which gave me this result, and Art Breeder, which gave me a more realistic result uh, using the artificial intelligence. 
So in the 3D program, whichever camera you're using and however you position that camera, whenever you feed that image into the artificial intelligence, it's going to respect that camera angle and do its best to generate a human version of the exact same 3D render. So this was the image I used at the beginning, right? So I still had the exact same lighting setup, but I just used the original statue of David and brought it into my scene and I framed my camera exactly like this. But you'll see this material that I'm using over here, uh, you can see it actually highlights a lot of these darker regions on the statue. And that's because with Octane Render, I'm using a dirt shader. So a dirt shader really gets into the overall crevices and it highlights these certain features. Like you can see the eye bags and the nose. And by having that information available, I feel like it's, it's basically going to provide the artificial intelligence with more information, which means that it can give you a little bit more of an accurate result when it starts generating a human face. But that was just from a statue and it still astounds me that it can analyze the statue image and then convert it into this, into this uh, human form. Okay, so you want to head on over to portraitai.app. It's actually not .com, it is .app. Uh, so this is where the magic is going to be happening. And this is the image that I'm going to be feeding into this artificial intelligence because it's exactly what I used to generate this face. But I'm also going to be showing you the results I get when I feed this image, which is a much more polished image, into the program. And because with this image, you can see some areas have, you know, some lighter areas on it. These ones are darker. The artificial intelligence is even going to respect this lighting information and then generate a face for us. But once you're on Portrait AI, all you have to do is go to pick a selfie. Okay, so I'm going to upload this image. It actually does it really quickly. So you can see it says painting and it will paint this image and generate a face in various different styles. So you can see it starts outputting all of these different faces for me which is really, really cool. And this is exactly how I got this face. Now, I don't know if it's going to generate the exact same face again. I think it is randomized. Probably won't get the exact same result. Yep, that is true. So I don't see this face here anymore. So you won't get the same result all the time. Uh, but this face was included in one of these uh, collages over here. And when I found it, I think it was one of these. I literally just saved that as an image and I was good to go. I was going to start using that and merging it and combining it on top of my uh, 3D render, which is actually this image. So I would save one of these images and I'm going to be combining it on top of this 3D render. And that's exactly how I got to this end result that you see over here. But now if I feed this image into Portrait AI, look at how the results differ. So here's the image, and now for some reason the artificial intelligence thinks this is supposed to be a female, uh, probably because maybe some of the features look quite feminine, but it gives me a much more feminine end result. But you can see it's still generating a face, and I felt like Portrait AI really worked well for what I was trying to go for because it still retains this uh, renaissance aesthetic where Art Breeder gives you a very realistic result, but this one gives you a really cool old school renaissance aesthetic uh, but this is the results i got from feeding this image into portrait ai so very cool stuff with technology uh, the fact that you can now generate a face from your 3d renders and then if you know how to merge that together and photo bash it uh, on top of your 3d render you can create some imagery like this so i also decided that i wanted to try another artificial uh, intelligent solution uh, but again, because of the end results for the final image, I wanted to use Portrait AI because of the Renaissance aesthetic. But if you want something more realistic, Art Breeder is fantastic. So I took this exact same image and I decided to upload it on Art Breeder. Now, Art Breeder is a paid uh, service, especially if you want to upload your own images. It's $9 a month. Uh, but I've got that image uploaded. And if I go to Portraits, you can see over here, you can do so much crazy stuff on Art Breeder. It actually blew my mind. So if I go to upload, right, I'm going to try and find my image. There we go. So you can see there's my image, my 3D image. 
upload it onto Artbreeder. And when you're uploading it on Artbreeder, it can take about an hour because you get added to a queue. But then when you come back, your image will be uploaded. But the cool thing is when it is uploaded, if I click on this, it gives me all of these different sliders, which is crazy. So you've got this incredible amount of customization. You can see I created this variant uh, from the original 3D render, but you can see I can change the age of my image. So if I'm, whoa, okay, that, <laughs> that's, that's looking a bit crazy. Um, maybe I want to, let's see, maybe reduce some of the chaos on this image over here. And you can see the image starts to change and maybe I want to make this guy, I don't know, you can change the race if you want him to include some Middle Eastern uh, aesthetics or Latino, you can do all of that. Um, so you got all of these sliders and this is where Art Breeder really comes in handy uh, with, you know, just generating these uh, different styles of images. Now uh, I'm trying to see how I got it to that particular complexion. I know I was playing around with a lot of the sliders. <laughs> you can see I can change the gender of the character as well just by adjusting the slider. So let me actually open up the saved version. Here we go. Look at that, man. This this is crazy. The stuff you can do with artificial intelligence. So I'm going to open up the saved version. So this was from adjusting some of these sliders. It gave me this end result. Uh, but I know this chaos slider, if you decrease this, it creates a much more realistic uh, end result. So these are the type of results you can get from Art Breeder. If you want something realistic that's referencing that image that you captured from that angle, this solution really, really comes in handy. And I wanted to highlight it and just show you guys what you can do. Uh, so yeah, I didn't use Art Breeder for my final result. Like I said, I used Portrait AI because I felt like it worked best with uh, the image I was trying to create. Okay, so it's Photoshop time, and I'm sure a lot of you are wondering how on earth do I actually combine this face onto my 3D render? So, like I discussed earlier, this is my final 3D render, and we use artificial intelligence to generate the face. So let me show you some techniques to combine this on the 3D render. So once I've downloaded my portrait AI image, or maybe I've got an image from Artbreeder, I'm going to drag and drop that onto my final 3D rendered image. If I see this message, I'll just click on yes. And I can go ahead and close that. And let's, let me just maximize the size of this. All right, so we've got our face. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to decrease the opacity. And I'm going to decrease the size of this face. And I want it to match as close as possible to the features on the 3D render. All right, and by decreasing the opacity, I can gauge where the 3D render is and where this image needs to be. And remember, we're only using the face. Let's see, that should be about fine. And now another way to alter the shape to get maybe the eyes to match closer with the eyes on the 3D character is to use a tool called Warp. And now if I click and drag in these certain regions, you can see that I can position this a lot more accurately. So if I needed to align that with the lips, this is exactly how I would actually do that. Now you can already see with the uh, opacity lowered, we already have a much more realistic looking face on the character. Now if I hide this, show it, hide and show it, show it you can see the difference that's been made. But now you'll notice that the color of the character's face and the color of the skin is completely different. So I need to make sure that I'm actually matching that or else it's not going to look uh, cohesive. So I go to image, go to hue and saturation, and then over here on the hue, if I play around with the slider, I can see this has a little bit of a red tint in it. Uh, I can just play around with this a bit and try my best to match it with that. Now this requires some finesse, a level of finesse and skill uh, to get this to match. It can be quite tricky. Uh, but there we go. So I tried to match that a little bit better. So we still got our portrait AI photo in here. And now I'm going to create a, I think this is an adjustment layer. Yeah, create an adjustment layer and select the adjustment layer. And now whenever I paint with black, I'll be erasing from this image. You can see when I paint with black, I'm erasing now the borders on the original image. And I can keep doing that on the hair 
as well to bring back the original 3D hair on our character. Now you can see over here that would be like a seam and just erasing those areas. So you can see immediately how this is becoming one piece with the 3D render. So if I hide this, show it, hide, show, you can see it makes a huge difference and it looks like this face is now part of the 3D render. So now it's just a matter of me trying to finesse this and get it to blend a lot better. Maybe I can bring up uh, some of the opacity over here just to see how this looks. And with my adjustment layer, if I paint with white, I'll basically be bringing back the original uh, AI portrait image. But black is erasing that. So if you've got a Wacom pen and some pressure sensitivity, uh, it will be a lot better to, a lot easier when it comes to blending uh, these areas together. You can see maybe over here I want to bring back some of the original geometry that was on the character. And you can see just how this starts blending together. Now if I want to, just to see what it looks like, I can, if I feel like I want some of this darker region back, maybe I can reveal some of the 3D character underneath because you can see the 3D character is a much more darker region in that area. Now I'm blending the light in from the 3D render with uh, this original, uh, with the image of the AI portrait. And like I said, definitely requires finessing uh, and just practice and painting and trying to see what looks right. You can see that makes a huge difference. So if I hide this, bring this back, hide, bring back, we officially got a face on our 3D character and this is the technique I used uh, to generate the artificial intelligence face and then merge it with a 3D render. So that was basically the technique and then once I'm done with it, presentation is always super important. So I'll create, you know, like the garment from multiple different angles uh, just to showcase, you know, the actual suit. And then I showed you how you can actually blend uh, one of those images directly onto a 3D render. And if you're going for, you know, the art breeder realistic images, that will also look really cool. But you can see this Renaissance aesthetic worked very well uh, with what I was trying to achieve. So I hope this technique has been useful. And now you can also experiment and try and merge those faces onto your 3D renders as well. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this breakdown video. Now, I hope you guys have found something useful from this workflow. I really love utilizing it, but I did start experimenting with artificial intelligence only recently, and I can see just how powerful it is uh, to include it within your workflow. Right, so as always, I truly pr appreciate the support on this channel. You guys are super awesome. Stay tuned for some more videos and tutorials, and goodbye.